the world of medicine, where every decision can change lives, your peace of mind is crucial. This is where Pattern steps in. Imagine insurance made simple, fast, and personalized just for you. With Pattern, you're not just getting disability and life insurance, you're insuring your future and protecting your greatest asset, your income. In the past 10 years, Pattern has transformed the way over 20,000 doctors secure their financial well-being. Discover the simplicity of securing your future at PatternLife.com or click the link in the description. We work hard as physicians to take care of the health and well-being of our patients. But when it comes to our money, do we have the same condition of care? Probably, probably not. Let's change that together. Welcome to the Financial Freedom for Physicians podcast, where we'll fight and advocate for your financial literacy. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. Thanks for being here. Let's jump into the show. Welcome to this week's podcast episode, and I'm really excited about today's guest, John Carroll, and he's a founder, CEO, strategist. And one thing we a lot of times forget about is giving back and contributing. A lot of times we're talking about the wealth accumulation, making it last, investing, going for success. He has a different approach, and he's talking about giving back and generosity. And it's going to be a really fascinating discussion, um, and I'm happy to welcome him to the show. So, John, welcome. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah. So you uh, founded City Leadership 2010, and it's intentionally placed between nonprofit sector, for-profits, government work in philanthropy. And talk about how you've built a dozen large communities, audiences, and talk about this idea of generosity. I know you've got several theses and ideas around it. Yeah, so uh, I'm a business owner, and uh, I'm sure like many of the people that listen to your podcast, I was being asked by friends and people I went to church with and uh, people in the community uh, to give back, you know, uh, whether it was the homeless shelter or the uh, uh, after school program. And uh, as I was thinking through that, uh, a lot of times I was being asked uh, just for money directly. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, um, you know, some of the times when they were when they were raising money for items, it, it didn't make good business sense. And I think um, you know the amount of money that they needed is more affordable to do it in a different kind of way. And and the way my company was set up, uh, we had a lot of um, uh, contract workers that we could kind of turn off and on. And uh, obviously, I knew their rates. And and I thought, um, man, instead of me giving you, um, you know, five thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand dollars, like. What if I just helped you get that done with some of my uh, contract staff? And that was mainly around digital marketing, video, photography, that kind of stuff at the time. And uh, I started coordinating those. And what ended up happening was is that is uh, it ended up being very successful, really helpful for a couple of thousand dollars. I could do what they were trying to raise thirty thousand dollars for, and and um, and so that ended up being really great. But as a business guy. Uh, I couldn't pay a contract worker a tax write-off, um, you know, a dollars uh, to be able to do this work, right? Like I had to pay them, you know, just money out of my own pocket. And I wanted the tax deduction. And so I was trying to figure that out. And uh, I couldn't <laughs> even, um, and what I ended up doing is creating a nonprofit. I could donate money to the nonprofit and then I could, then I could hire contract workers to actually do work for nonprofits. Well. That just started as like a little side project in, in uh, you know, 2008 and then 2010, we really formed the nonprofit. And then uh, man, over the past 14 years, it's just gotten bigger and bigger. We now have 20 full-time employees and and I sold my company in 2016 and I actually came on staff uh, here um, in 2017. And uh, we get up every single day and try to help the good guys do more good uh, and try to help uh, other orgs uh, do that work. And, uh, and all that's really based out of just really bringing business principles, the stuff that your listeners uh, are using every day to make their own financial capacity grow. We add those to the uh, impact of people's mission uh, more so than I guess their money. And uh, that's how we get our work done in city leadership. Yeah, 
it, and I love this idea because um, one thing uh, we talk about because you, you alluded to earlier kind of bartering and kind of trading services uh, which is really a, a smart way to do it and um, I was reading this book I can't um, a couple years back where it's like the value of barter could exceed the monetary value so you know talking about donations a lot I get a lot of requests for you know charity and all of that but um, there's other ways to donate or, or to help contribute so what are those ways besides just a flat out donation yeah I think you know yeah answering your question around that what ends up happening is is that uh, a lot of people get asked uh, for you know just money straight out uh, <laughs> and I think that um, that's honestly what a lot of nonprofits you know really need they need the, the financial resources mainly because you and I as business leaders uh, or just even as generous citizens in our community like either we don't have the expertise to actually provide the frontline service we don't have the expertise to actually provide um, the build out or whatever of what they're trying to add on to you know uh, or even if we do, we don't have the time or even uh, honestly the passion to be committed to it as consistently as the nonprofit needs to be able to provide that effort or energy for it. So money is obviously uh, when well stewarded is the best uh, resource to be able to give to organizations besides your really your passionate, engaged leadership. And I think that that's what organizations really need. Um, they need us to be actively involved. But honestly, volunteerism is really, really hard uh, uh, these days, um, mainly because our lives are so interesting, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, um, there's so much recreational sports, uh, there's so much to do with your kids, uh, there's so many opportunities uh, to go do socially things, whether it is go hang out at the local beer garden or to go travel in your RV uh, or these wonderful backyard oases that we all build. And so volunteerism uh, consistency is down because life enjoyment is up. Um, and then leadership engagement is also down, I believe, because entrepreneurship is up. You know, I mean, listening to your podcast, the, you've got listeners who are these medical professionals. They've spent all this time in education. They've become pros at their craft, and they're ten years into doing, you know, uh, heart surgeries or you know, general practitionership or whatever it is. And they're already spending their free time investing in real estate or trying to buy stocks or figuring out, uh, you know, the next sort of corporate entrepreneur investment. Um, and there's so much upside. Uh, in our culture these days with that uh, sort of time issue is that it's hard to get these thought leaders actually engaged in these organizations at a level that allows them to actually make a difference. And so that's a very complex issue uh, in our society. And honestly, I believe because of that, because of those issues, we are suffering as a society. We don't have generous thought leaders spending enough time to make a difference in that space. They might be adjacent to it a little bit. They might know about it, but they're not actually engaged far enough to be able to do it. And so then what ends up happening is, is they end up giving some of that money they're making away. Um, and there's a big tension there that we've got to figure out as a society. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting to talk about volunteerism and um, you, I love how you're describing this volunteerism from being a hobbyist and something you do, you know, weekends or, you know, special occasions to, you know, actually being active in, in doing it about causes you're passionate about. So one question I have is um, what are some of the areas in the nonprofit sector that are really um, burgeoning, very active with a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, proactivity and a lot of um, just you know a lot of volunteers just a lot of um, uh, contributions um, what are some of those areas well you know uh, it's all over the place I mean honestly you know really what ends up happening uh, I believe is it's um, it's not that people like you and I weren't we're obviously aware that there are needs in our community and we're aware that nonprofits need resources. And honestly, you know, you and I and anybody we brought on here, we could get them to start talking about things that really 
uh, interests them or something that they're passionate about, whether it's educating kids or caring for the elderly or worrying about the homeless or trying to stop, stop crime, you know, all yeah. those people have different interests that are out there. But where we see resources uh, are honestly is that the organizations, uh, the nonprofits that have leadership that really drive towards those resources. Um, you know, everything rises and falls on leadership. And so um, one of the things that either happens is, is that either the leader at that organization is really good at raising resources and the or leader of that organization is really good at making an impact. Yeah. What is more likely to happen is, is that the leader of the org is one or the other. Uh, you know, rarely are they both. You probably have never heard of people that are neither, right? They can't raise money. They can't raise impact. Uh, you, you might have a friend or somebody who's, who's tried to start something that you're, you're kind of a little aware of, but usually you don't hear of those orgs because they're not out there uh, anymore. They may have gotten started, but they weren't out there very long high impact and then they're struggling to make their money that that's a very very common uh -huh. and then high fundraising and struggling to make an impact those are the ones that you probably actually know more of than anything <laughs> um, because it is rare to have high funds and high impact and i think you know um it's a very dynamic deal to have a leaders in that space and i think you know, historically, you've got somebody who's running the nonprofit who knows how to make a high impact, and you've got a board and community advisors who are able to come on and, and raise and provide a lot of the funding. Um, but with a decreasing, you know, amount of people that are engaging in that sort of way, um, you know, that's less there. Uh, and what ends up happening is, is that uh, our wealth ends up getting transferred uh, either through, you know, not really knowing if that org is making a high impact, you just got won over uh, by uh, a, a leader there. And so you end up writing a big check and continuing to fund, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or um, it's just something you're passionate about and you throw a lot of money into. And we see some of these really big checks that are coming out. I mean, just yesterday, you know, a woman gave a billion dollars to a, a college in New York uh, to be able to provide, you know, free tuition for any student that, that goes there, uh, which is really awesome um, uh, and really, really, you know, really great. Um, but we see some of that, and I think some of that actually paralyzes the everyday giver um, and, and makes people like me and you who can't write a billion dollar check feel like, well, they've got it. That's the generosity. But when, when, the, when the rubber hits the road, there's actually hundreds, if not thousands of nonprofits in our major cities that really need us to engage, um, not with a billion dollar check, um, but with maybe a $10,000 check every single year. And not just with a $10,000 check, but really active engaging board membership. And one of the things I would say for you guys is, is as we think about it, is all of us are really wrestling with what's our return on investment. You know, even as a med student, you think I'm going to invest all this time and money into med school. What's the return on it? You become a doctor that makes some money. Can you make enough money to pay off that debt and have the lifestyle you want? But even now you have that money. Where are my other investments? Real estate, you know, stocks, different kind of stuff. And you're thinking about the ROI. We really challenge people to think about your ROG. What is your return on your generosity? Mm -hmm. um, where are you being generous? You know, where can, where can you give and what kind of impact are you getting for that? And how do you hold a nonprofit accountable, you know, for that sort of stuff? And I think once you start thinking that way, then you start really imagining generosity at a different way that takes you on a different journey of questions you need to ask yourself and things you need to learn and ways you even spend your disposable income uh, in ways to be able to make an impact for others. I love this idea of return on generosity. And it reminds me of um, another podcast guest I had. He was talking about return on relationship capital, you know, building this relationship. So, and I'm sure the return on generosity, if you measured it in terms of impact, it's, you know, higher than you know, any sort of um, financial investment like a real estate or stock because um, just you're helping, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions. Um, we were talking backstage uh, and one thing that was really interesting is um, Ray, you were talking about the billion dollar check. Um, I think it was to, for free tuition for, for medical school in, in perpetuity, which is, you know, fascinating. Um, but, you know, the rich get pitched all the time, you know, donate to this, donate to that. And they essentially, you know, they don't, their time and their energy is finite. So, and then 
you talk about this area where they're not given the opportunity to give. I'm really curious if you could elucidate that for the audience. Yeah, I think you know, what I was talking about is finding what you say yes to and really building not only your capacity for, um, but building your skills around how to say no really well. Um, so here's the reality. Um, man, if you're a doctor or if you have any sort of business sense or if you have any sort of wealth, um, you are going to get pitched by people. You are going to be pursued and pitched by people for opportunities to be generous. Um, and you, you can't hold that back. You know, they're going to find their way to you. They're, um, whether that's directly or through a friend or through something. And, and people are going to ask you to give. And I think that one, I would just say is that knowing how to say yes and knowing how to say no begins with even before you get asked is like, you know, where, where do you have, you know, psychological ownership and passion of making a difference? And I think that really thinking through that is a, is a whole different thing is eliminating everything as an opportunity and really focusing on where do I feel like I have responsibility? And that can help you really clear up you know, and create clarity around meetings you want to take, relationships you want to build, and pursuing your best yes, and eliminating the amount of times that you have to go through the process of saying no. Because if you're saying, hey, you know what? Yes, I want the environment to be wonderful, but that's not where I feel a sense of responsibility. I feel a sense of responsibility in health. And so I want to donate to local health clinics and to health prevention, health education. That's where I'd like to see and focus my generosity. It could be the exact opposite, but pre-deciding some of that doesn't mean you can't have a meeting or that you can't give anything, but it really, when you start having the kind of wealth that you're trying to inspire your listeners to have, having a strategy about where you impact can help you identify the things you say yes to. The reality though is, is that where we're at right now as a society, expenses are way up. Cost of doing nonprofits are way up, right? And so with that, inflation as well is hitting us personally in our pocketbook. And so gas prices are up, car insurance is up, you know, uh, buying a house, interest rates are up, all that kind of stuff. So there's a less disposable income as well, even for the wealthy. And so, you know, if their expenses were X, you know, the last couple of years, well, they're now Y. And so that gap of $2,000, $5,000, $10,000 a month of different kinds of stuff eliminates the ability to, to be able to give that extra charity in that kind of space. At the same time, the nonprofit needs more money, right? So like to do the same amount of impact that cost a million dollars last year, well, this year they need 1.1 million. And so they're coming to people looking for that kind of thing. And asking is way up. Nonprofits are asking as many people as possible and what happens is, is that you, as someone who's generous, you might have been asked 10 times last year for five, 10, $20,000, $100,000 or more. This year, you might get asked 50 times. Mm -hmm. And the pain emotionally of being going through that process of how, because you can only say yes so many times, right? It, it doesn't matter. You know, exposing yourself to 500 pitches. Uh, you know, if you can only give away 50000 or $250,000 a year or whatever it is, $2 million, whatever, there's still a limited amount of your resources that you can give away. And so exposing yourself to 500 pitches when you can really only you know, fund or say yes to 5, 10 or 15 can become an exhausting enterprise for you and emotionally. And what we see is generosity ends up kind of closing the door a little bit saying, hey, I don't want to hear any more pitches. I'm just whatever. I'm just going to give it all to whatever. I'm just going to, you'll kind of write off kind of your hope and your impact and your strategy. It's kind of like just taking all your money and throwing it in a mutual fund and just letting somebody <laughs> else manage it and just saying, I don't care. I'll just retire with whatever they give. Yeah. But I think your audience is thinking about investment in a way where they're going, no, 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 no. I want to be more strategic. I don't want to put all this money in a mutual fund. I might put a little bit over there to whatever, but I want to think about you know, aggressive real estate or what's going on with these NFTs even, or you know, how, how is Bitcoin doing? And they're worried about that. And I think that their generosity should be more focused in that sort of area. And yeah. so how to be able to think through that sort of thing. And so then 
What you do is, is when you get aggressive in that way, you end up getting to hear the right pitches for what you can be generous to. You still have to say no some, but you keep that energy. And then also when you know what you're going to say yes and no to, you save the, the operator time, you know, nonprofits, usually the person who's best at executing the nonprofit role is also the one who's best at fundraising. And so they're the ones coming to talk to you about raising money. Mm-hmm. Man, they don't need 50 more lunch meetings to raise money and to hear 48 no's. They got it. They need to whittle that down. And so if you already know you're saying no, don't take their time. Uh, Because they need to go do the work of the stuff and they need to spend time with people who really want to be involved and say yes. So just because they ask, it's not being nice to actually take their time and take the meeting, spend two hours, do whatever. Um, Because for you, it's, it's an hour and a half lunch and it's hearing their story. For them, it's hours of prep and research and not taking another meeting and not being in their nonprofit making a difference so that they can come there. And if you already know you're saying no, you know, say, hey, I'm not gonna be able to give to you. If you'd still like to have lunch, it'd be great. But if you wanna invite me to some event that you're having, or I'd love to read more about your stuff just so I can know about, because I am curious, but I don't wanna take some of your time. No. You think you're hurting their feelings by saying that, but honestly, it's a gift. Uh, and you either you give them their time back or go give charitably. And a lot of times, you know, for me, I find people ask me for a lunch or that kind of stuff. I'm like, hey, I can't do that, but I just went on your website. I read about it and I went on your giving page and I just gave you guys 50 bucks. I know that's not much, but I just want to let you know I'm rooting for you and hope you do well. I'm following you on social media and uh, you guys get after it. Great way for me to say no with kindness and engagement and curiosity but also you know, be really clear that, hey, I don't have that big check you're looking for, you know, my investment's going elsewhere. I love that. I love this idea. We're gonna have to have you on in the future because this power of no, um, and it's really very powerful once you understand that and that's because what you say uh, no to, you also say yes to other things and it's talking about this opportunity cost. Um, how can people contact you to check out your nonprofit reach out to you, follow you on socials, et cetera. Yeah, so our website is cityleadership.org, cityleadership.org. And you can see all the platforms that we run around here, including Give901. If you're listening to this and you want to give to something, you can go check that out and and drop a little money in there. Uh, uh, We we give it all away. There's no overhead, no lag time on those kind of things. But uh, I'm on the socials. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, John Carroll 77, J O H N C A R R O L L 77. You can find me on all those. Uh, come find me, uh, send me a message, and uh, man, hope you can uh, you know, grow your ability to be generous uh, as you grow your uh, financial freedom as well. Yeah, yeah, I love that. They're listening. John, for coming on, give him a like and follow on all the socials. Check out his nonprofit, donate, um, help out, contribute. And with that, thanks so much for coming on. Doctors dedicate their lives to caring for others. It's time someone took care of you. Visit PatternLife.com to simplify your path to peace of mind. PatternLife.com, simplifying your insurance journey. I'm excited that you made it for another episode. You are truly the best. If you've been following the show for a while, you know that my passion is to bring you the education you need to find your path to financial freedom. Please come back week after week for new content, new resources, and great guests. Until then, if you haven't already, please be sure to check out the website, www.drchrisluemdphd.com for more support. I'll see you next week.